RCO, report range, go for launch. Range is go for launch. LCDR, this is LVD, go for launch. Roger. July 2003. On. The United States prepares to send a robotic land rover to explore the planet Mars. 20 seconds. The quest to hunt for water and for signs that humans are not alone in the universe. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, main engine start, zero and liftoff of the Delta rocket with opportunity. The transients have liftoff. Engine position looks good. Recovering nicely from the liftoff transients, and the solid rocket motors are increasing their thrust during their 75 second burn. Main engine chamber pressure is holding steady. The heavens above have long been a target for exploration, for determining humanity's role in the great scheme of things. Some find the answers in religion and spirituality. Others find comfort in the hard facts of science. Earth may be a rare environment, uniquely designed for nurturing living organisms. But as humans explore the creation of the planet, the realization grows that the answers to the origins of life may lie beyond earthly bounds. Nobody knows how or when life began on Earth. And really the only way that you can begin to evaluate when or how life began is by examining the geological record. Dr. Stephen Mojis of the University of Colorado is examining some of the planet's oldest rock here in Greenland at the top of the planet. When Earth was originally formed, it was a ball of molten rock so hot, no organic materials containing living organisms could have survived. As it cooled, the Earth would have consisted only of sterile oceans and barren rock. The early Earth's surface was not rich in organic compounds. It was a surface that was dominated by compounds that are not particularly helpful to get life started. And if no organic material could exist on such a barren planet, life on Earth may have started elsewhere. My personal opinion is that uh, since space is so rich in these organic compounds, it must have played a role. I don't think it's unreasonable to invoke the space medium as a source area for raw materials to get life started, because after all, Space is close. Space is only about 30 kilometers that way. All you have to do is take material from up there and bring it here. That's not far. And that is an infinite resource. More than four and a half billion years ago, the solar system was formed from huge clumps of ice, dust, and rock left over from the creation of the universe. These clumps, called planetesimals, collided, growing in size as the larger planetesimals drew in smaller objects. Planet Earth was born from these molten collisions. The smaller objects not absorbed during the planet creation process were drawn to the outer edges of the solar system. There, just over three light years away from the sun, these comets and asteroids turned into an immense cloud called the Oort cloud. 
The solar system, with its sun and planets and stars and Oort cloud in tow, circles the Milky Way galaxy once every 225 million years. However, the 200 billion stars in the galaxy don't follow uniform circular orbits. They shift with each revolution. That sometimes brings the sun and the Oort cloud into close contact with other stars and interstellar clouds. These close encounters can disturb the Oort cloud, spinning comets trailing long tails of cosmic debris out of their normal orbit and directly into the Earth's path. These occur when the star comes very close to the sun, perhaps within 3,000 astronomical units, where an astronomical unit is the Earth's distance from the sun. Or when we encounter a giant molecular cloud in the galaxy. These are very large clouds of interstellar gas where stars are forming. And these can really shake up the Oort cloud and throw many, many comets in, in what we call a comet shower. These comet showers figure into one of the aboriginal myths of creation. For some aborigines in Australia, this is their holy land, the birthplace of humankind, a link between Earth and the heavens above. For these aborigines, each star in the Milky Way is a dancing goddess. The legend goes that long ago, one of the goddesses lay her baby in a cradle to rest. But the cradle rocked, and the child fell to earth. The impact left this jagged three-mile-wide crater in the desert of the Australian interior, and, so the story goes, created life. Scientists of today think those aborigines may well have got it right. Impact craters like this sprinkle the globe, evidence of massive collisions between asteroids and comets and planet Earth. Scientists now believe these stellar collisions brought to our world organic elements of life from deep in outer space, creating the rich and varied tapestry of living organisms we've come to view as what makes Earth unique in the universe. Hey, that's too weak. Okay. Instead of photographing Soviet missile silos, this former U-2 spy plane roams the skies above, collecting dust. Right space dust. Earth's atmosphere is full of microscopic material shed by passing comets. While cruising at 65,000 feet, 12 miles high, the pilot will deploy these oil-coated plexiglass plates. For every hour aloft, one of these plates will catch just a single particle of space dust. These particles are debris coming off the trail of asteroids and meteorites. Called micrometeorites, they weigh a mere one billionth of a gram, hitting the Earth at a rate of one particle per square meter per day. Well, the particles have told us a very interesting story. University of Washington astronomer Dr. Donald Brownlee is the father of micrometeorites. Brownlee believes these dust particles, also known as Brownlee particles, hold the answer to the origins of life on Earth. 